please welcome Dr. Michael McManaman. Thank you, Judy, and welcome, everyone, and thanks, Brian, so much. And I want to say I'm not going to mention anything about the Leafs or the Bruins, so <laughs> we'll just leave that aside. We won't talk about what happened or anything about it at all, okay? <laughs> no, it's terrible, isn't it? But I know what it's like. It's same thing happened in Vancouver, huh? But whatever, it seems to be, we'll leave it alone. And so, <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here, and this is when... Um, I wanted to say that um, having, I, my softer side is that I have six children and 13 grandchildren, despite the fact that I had Asperger's, I could figure out a lot of things. And I, and I have had a productive life despite running into a lot of walls all the time and problems until I figured out uh, my diagnosis is what allowed me to sort of open the, the doors and become you know, the person I really wanted to become. And so everything has changed. In a, I'm going to set my timer here so I don't go over because that's my problem. I can get off on a tangent. So um, I also want to say just a little bit, of, uh, I want to change the format a little bit. One, one of the other events we had, we had people come up in front of the panelists and ask their question. And that way you have seven people being able to ask questions at once. So I think we're going to switch that, if you don't mind, and not have you all do one question at a time because we'll be here for, for three hours. And this way we can just, you can come up and stand in front of your panelists and ask them the question and you'll, you'll get a lot more done that way. So that's my prerogative since I am in charge. I can do that. <laughs> Sorry, Judy. And, uh, and so uh, I wanted to mention, um, you, might, you got this in your, uh, in your materials. Most of you can share if you don't have one. This is my notes for the evening so you can follow along. And I'm a visual learner because I have Asperger's. This was started by Mark Twain, actually, who used to um, do visual notes for his speeches. So we'll, we're just going to follow along here. And the first little graphic you have is a shifter for our car, right? And that, that is going to remind me to talk to you about Shift Happens. And what Shift Happens is a little story about a student at our Berkeley Center in California who was having trouble uh, with his cognitive rigidity, real, real Aspie kid who had real strong rigidity. And we were at his parent meeting, and he said, um, you know, he started talking about the other word happens, and I said, no, Sam, shift happens. And so I got him a T-shirt to wear around saying shift happens, and our, our students all wanted one, so I ended up getting them for them. So. The, the reason that is there, number one, is because that's the number one, if you're on the autism spectrum, that's the number one problem is cognitive rigidity. And so the antidote is cognitive flexibility. And how do you teach that? Well, that could be a whole two-hour lecture right now by me, because I can talk about that, but I can't I have to move on to the next slide. So what's the next slide? Anyone have any idea? Okay, so parents and professionals have to be a clearinghouse and a headhunter for their student, okay? It's your role to introduce the right services and the quality and quality mentors to your student's life. That's your role. And to allow the student to make positive change. So you have to find a way to do that, and a lot of these people are going to give you the answers to that here today. The next graphic, what is that? Anyone have any clue? That's the law of regression of diminishing returns and what in that's Aspie language for what that means to you as parents especially is that the more that you advocate for your student after high school the less they do and the worse it becomes before high school in junior high and high school it's the opposite so the more that you advocate after high school the more that you disenfranchise your kid and, and make them disempowered. So it works the opposite, even though it, hap it worked in high school and junior high and grade school, it works against it after that. So I call it the law of regression. You think that it's going to still work, but it's not going to work to manage your kid at college. It's not going to work to call them on the cell phone to get them up out of you know, bed. It's not going to work. So you have to come up with other things to do. So the next one, anyone have an idea about this crazy woman with a chainsaw and a baby? 
severing the umbilical cord. That's right, not being helicopter parents. This is the steel umbilical cord that has to be cut with a diamond blade from both sides. The kids are better at cutting it than you are. And it's a, it's a psychological, it's a, an emotional umbilical cord. It's a lot, you can say, oh yeah, I sent him to camp, he stayed, and I've done all those things already. Yeah, he's used to being away from home. But are you gonna pick up your life after he leaves and go to school or get a job? And the more that you do that, the better the kid's gonna do. And you do have to monitor people. It's not, you know, like Ronald Reagan said, it's peace through, you know, through, um, uh, what's the word? Through making sure that things are really, you know, happening. Let's have peace, but let's make sure you don't, you don't, you don't, you know, you're reducing your arms and everything else. So that, that's a bad analogy, by the way. But anyway, we're going to go on. What's the next one with the? Empty words. What's that? Empty words. Empty what? Words. Empty words? No, no. They're backpacks. They're carrying these, <laughs> and this is from a parent that said to me, "Let them struggle. What they need." I asked the parent, "What can we do better?" After the program, she says, "You need to let my kids struggle more while they're with you, so that when they get out, they're really prepared." You know that teacher that makes you work really hard, and then when you get in the next class, you hate that teacher while you're with them, but after you get by them, you say, wow, that teacher really cared about us and really taught me what I needed to know to be prepared. Well, we gotta let them struggle. You can't let them have the easy way on everything and then send them to us or someone else here and expect them to do well. You have to let them struggle some. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna go on. Teach them to fish rather than giving them a fish. And what's the next one, a DM? Anyone have any idea? Default mode. What's, what's the default mode of people on the spectrum? Anyone know? What do you go back to? Like, you know, the Flintstones, the dog is let out the front door, goes in the side door, in the window, right? <laughs> it's the default mode on the spectrum is isolation. And I don't care your whole life. That's what you're going to want to do when you continue to fail in relationships or a college or whatever. You're going to want to go in your room, get on your computer, and zone out. And, or you'll be the strange guy in the building with a little thing walking up the stairs and say, who lives in 2A? You know, I don't know. It's that guy that doesn't talk to anyone. So you have to, you have to fight that. Students have to fight it, and parents have to fight it. What's the next one? Anyone have an idea? Is you have to support yourself. If you're not well, then your kid's not going to be a healthy parent, healthy child. It doesn't work. If you sacrifice your life for your kid, you're, it's not going to work. So you have to take care of your primary relationship with your spouse and yourself first. It's like on the airplanes, they say, put the oxygen on yourself, then your favorite child after that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you have to do it to yourself first or you'll black, you'll black out before you can do it. What's the next one? It's not the World Trade Center. What is it? It's that it's a bar graph. The more, the better you take care of yourself, the better the kid does. The more you let go, the better the kid does. It's the opposite of what it was in high school. And if you put the ball down, they will come in the room and pick it up. But if you say, here, take the ball, take the ball, take the ball, they're not going to take it. And guess what? You have about three seconds. The first three words out of your mouth, your kid tunes you out. And I could say the same thing that you said, and they'll listen to me, but they won't listen to you. I had that happen to all my kids, and it was like, Humiliating, you know, this guy would teach, they would listen to this guy, but not me. But it happens everywhere. Soda. So what's the soda, the can of soda? Anyone know what that stands for? Boy, well, my staff should know it, but they're pretending like they don't. Do you Ex know it? Explosions. No, it's not explosions. <laughs> Stop, observe, deliberate, and take action. So we teach our students to take a soda. You know, if you're having a problem, Stop, look at what's really happening, observe what's happening, think about what the solution is, and then take action. And so what's the next one? What's the donkey there for? Anyone Stubborn know? Stubborn as a mule. What? Stubborn as a mule? Well, that's, true. that's part of it. So the donkey rule is if, you, if you're thinking it's a donkey and five other people that you know who you trust who are your mentors say it's a horse, then don't be a jackass and do what they say. <laughs> and that's what we teach that to our students because the cognitive rigidity is, this is why I, me, Michael, after 10 years of being diagnosed, has a, speaks all over the world and has six programs in the US 
and can have relationship with my children, et cetera, because I use the donkey rule. I ask people, do you think it's all right to do this and this and this and this? If I don't know an answer, I ask five engineers if it's an engineering problem, and then, then guess what? They know more about engineering than I do. And part of our, on the spectrum, part of it is that I have six minutes left, so I'm all self-monitoring, yeah. self-regulating. <laughs> and uh, and if they, if they, if I, I don't know everything about everything, and that's, that's that, you know, know it allism about people on the spectrum. Like, I think just because I'm smart in this one area, well, it's not. We're like huge spikes and huge bottoms. We're very smart in some areas and probably duller than a 12-year-old in some other areas, and it happens all the time. So it's a different profile. What's the next one? WWG, when will we get there? <laughs> and what that means is that um, George McClowski, who works on uh, executive functions, said, you know, it's going to take a long time when the kid on, with the kid who's developmentally, usually three to five years behind developmentally, doesn't mean they're not smarter than you are. They are. But developmentally, socially, in other ways, they're behind. So it's going to take a long time into their 30s, probably, to get them to get settled in a good job and have the skills and support. And the student has to be willing to engage for that to happen. So what's the next one? That door with the W on it. It's not a women's room. <laughs> it's that's the door of willingness that you need to open. So the students that are here, you have to be willing to try new things. You have to be willing to engage, to ask questions, to advocate for yourself. If you're just going to be quiet and let it all continue every way the way it was before, you're not going to make it. You're not going to have a relationship. You're not going to have a college degree. You're not going to have a job. You have to speak up and be willing to try new things all the time the rest of your life. Okay, so we used one Garmin to get up here and I took out my cell phone and we said, this one's working better, let's use this one and it worked better. And we got here, we found Glebe Avenue, whatever it is, street. Okay, so you just have to be willing to try new things. The willingness to engage and, and be involved. The PCP means person-centered planning. This is what you need to be looking at, this, what supports do you need and how do you build a community around you? How, who do you partner with? Who do you, who, what supports do you need and how do you get them? Not just your mom go get them for you. How do you get them? And how do you teach your child to do this for themselves? It's really important. That's, that's one of the most critical things that they learn how to do it for themselves. So if a student comes to one of our advisors to solve a problem with his academics or budgeting or anything, the, the, the advisor doesn't do it for him. He puts him on the phone to the bank or he, he says, okay, try this. Call the pharmacy or whatever, whatever the problem is, but you let them do it. Otherwise, they don't learn to do it, right? Okay, I'm getting there. Three minutes. Okay, it's going to be tough. What's the tulips for? The tulips are, well, up here, they're, they're, not, they're probably not out yet, but they're coming. In the U.S. anyway, the tulips, some of them bloom in early May. Some of them bloom in the middle of May. Most of them bloom in the middle of May. And then some of them bloom, bloom at the end of May. But the vast majority bloom in the middle of May, at least in Massachusetts. And so what happens is that those are, that just says that some of us bloom early. We're early bloomers. Some of us are late bloomers. And guess what? The tulips that bloom late are just as beautiful as the ones in the middle that, with, when everyone else blooms. In fact, you almost appreciate them more because they're by themselves at the end of May. So that's us on the spectrum. We bloom late, but we continue to bloom, and we bloom way longer than most people, and we, and we are young at heart, and that's a good quality. I'm like immature at 50, 64, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, it can get me in trouble too. But, uh, and the next one, and I'm going to end... Uh, I'm going to take my extra minute. Uh, the other one is thanks for coming. And Think Positive is, I'll just tell you the story since I have a minute and a half of the Think Positive stones, if you got one. When I was opening my program in Berkeley, California, I was there by myself with my cell phone in my rental car, looking around and trying to find, you know, how, how am I going to staff it? What's the building going to be? How do I do a cam charge, which I didn't even know what it was for the building? How do I get phone service? everything. I'm trying to do this by myself. I'm getting very frustrated and I'm saying to myself, 
Michael, you just think positive. I'm very, f and I'm walking down the street, and Berkeley is a very strange town if you've never been in it. It's really cool, actually. I like it there. It's very diverse. Probably a number one disability city in the U.S. You know, they invented the curb cuts and everything. So I look over on the on the window sill in a store, and there's a think positive stone, which would be pretty normal for Berkeley. This kind of behavior you have there. I picked it up, and it was, I put it in my pocket, and it and it made me think. I think I think positive. And I kept it there for a couple of days, and it was a sensory, like a worry stone for me, too. Like, like an Aspie thing I, that I could use to like, stop worrying in my pocket. But it also directed my thoughts to be positive and to think of and just stay up and motivated. And so I started giving these stones out. I found a source. I put it back on the windowsill. I put them all over. And I took them to conferences, and I have 15 seconds. I'm going to use probably an extra two. Uh, and uh, I took them all over the world and gave them out to people and at conferences, and people would get back stories to me like, you know that my sister-in-law had cancer, and I put it on her, my brother-in-law put it on the windowsill by, uh-oh, by the windowsill, and, and she felt better. And they would give me all this feedback all over the world about these stones. So last part of it. I had been taking these stones in Florida from this church that had stones all over the place in their gardens. I'd been taking a bag of them and making these stones. And I felt guilty about it, like being Irish Catholic, you know. And uh, <laughs> so I went to the place in Florida where they make the heavy stones, and I got bags of them. And I put two big bags by the church door on a Sunday morning with a note telling them the story of the stones. And I felt like Martin Luther, you know. Putting, putting my little piece, piece of, nailing my thing to the door. But, um, and, I, and I just want to tell you that I told them how these stones had done so many good things for people all over the world and that for some reason these, these stupid stones that I give out had a big effect. Anyway, I, I'm just sort of setting you up for the panel here. And thank you for coming and I'll shut up and pass it over to our next speaker. Thank you.